When you learn to garden, you also pick up some key life skills. We'll look at area programs across the region that are teaching students of all ages about the benefits of growing your own food. On this edition of Great Gardening, straight ahead. We grow a lot of carrots. People don't realize they can grow mountain laurel here. A lot of gardeners treat their gardens like art projects. We rely on bees for the food that we eat. Well, its common name is Angel's Trumpet. Gardening is definitely my quiet, quiet time. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening. I'm Pamela Fish. We'll take a tour of gardens that were built to educate coming up. But right now we welcome back horticulturist and educator Bob Olin and garden professional Deb Burns Erickson. Both very knowledgeable, I might say. And you guys have, have both academic and hands-on training, right? It's You're always learning. Yeah, it's a good combination. Yeah. Like we said, you get the formal training and then you really begin to learn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Get your hands okay. Yes. Well, we're going to talk a lot about uh, learning to garden and, and what that means. But, um, and this is why we have you here to field garden questions because you guys, you guys know your stuff. Uh, we also want to welcome our phone volunteers this week from the Duluth Garden Flower Society Morgan Park Club. You can call them at 218-788-2844 or toll free 877-307-8762. We'll have those numbers up on the screen. You can also email your questions to askgardening at wdse.org. We'll have live answers from our experts. Okay, here's a look at the signs of the season. This is some of what you might be seeing outside today. Uh, things are starting to bud out out there. Finally. Finally, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. They're starting too. Uh, they're starting, they're look, slow this last, year. Yes, it's, it's yeah, a cool gosh. spring so far, without a doubt. Uh-huh, definitely, Hopefully, definitely. very soon we're gonna see some uh, Some leafing, yeah. <laughs> some green, some green, definitely. All right, well, uh, we also have a picture that uh, comes from a gardener in Cotton, Minnesota. This is from Steve Rice. And it's a little hard to see there, but those are porcupines in that tree. And he got a nice shot of them. And uh, who knew they climbed that high and, and they get after the trees, don't they? Mm, they really do. They took down one of my beautiful white pine <gasps> just by girdling it. So really? I'm, not a, I'm not a big porcupine a fan. fan. It's yeah. amazing. I didn't know they climbed that high either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they can do it. They yeah. can do a lot of damage. Yeah. For sure. Well, fun picture. Thanks for sharing that, Steve. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we have um, a good list of questions left over from last time, so we're going to try to roll through roll some through. of those yeah. before the new ones start coming in. And uh, here we go. Tom from Washburn wants to know when is it safe to plant onion starts? Right now. Right now. Yeah, oh. it's one of the earliest. Uh, vegetable crops that you can plant you can go right now as long as mm -hmm. it isn't too wet, wet. Mm -hmm. you might want to hold off a little bit if it's if his garden area is really moist not too much compaction they can go right now they'll take any kind of frost we're going to get from this point on great uh, elaine wants to know when should i remove insulated foam covers from my hydrangeas I, I, i'd get them off now okay yeah. and we're not big fans of some of these either no, because no. they can actually accumulate hold heat, the heat hold longer the heat. than and yeah and, and have them butt out before the so before you're saying time. that's something you wouldn't cover them mm -mm. with what would you well, use depends on the hydrangea i mean there's okay. so many hardy hydrangeas now paniculatus sure. macrophilias that you really don't need you the don't protection because mm. no. okay. they're not going to do well right yeah but okay a lot of, well, that's good to know great great choices mm -hmm. out there that, a uh, lot more yeah all right, Wayne from Saginaw wants to know, should I apply fertilizer to my maple tree if it's looking a little sparse? If so, when and what type? Well, go ahead. Well, I, I didn't think that trees really needed much fertilizer need at all. No, I just no. wouldn't waste my money. I mean, a lot of times it seems like somebody's selling you something if they want you to fertilize it, but. If he feels it's a little little sparse, it should go right now at bud break, mm -hmm. and right on what we call a drip line. Because mm -hmm. right. this is where Not all the, inside, right. this is mm -hmm. where all the active roots are beginning to emerge, mm -hmm. and uh, you want to apply a little bit more than the grass is going to take up, so it bleeds through down into the root zone. But right now, or just at bud break, is a good time. Not okay. before that. Connie from Clinton Township has anyone developed a fingerling sweet potato? <laughs> and she says, or she or he says, preferably from the red garnet or Jersey. <laughs> I get a kick out of that because sweet potatoes are warm season crops. Right. And everything I've grown until last year were really of 
fingerling size. I don't really think there is such a thing as a fingerling uh, sweet potato. There are a lot okay. of colors and others, but the fingerling potato is an Irish potato. And actually, ours are smaller because we don't have enough warm temperatures. But we now, last year in particular, warmer nights, and we're getting some larger sweet potatoes. And there'll be a project. I'd like to be in a situation where we had to develop one because they've been pretty small could, so right? far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is microclover a perennial for zone two to three? What other grass seed varieties would be a good mix for poor soil conditions with high shade? High shade's tough. High shade is really tough. Really tough. And a mi microclover, clover. they call that. Mm-hmm. You know, um, a lot of those clovers will do pretty well in certain situations, mm -hmm. but they can also be very aggressive. You right, might, might want to act. Mm -hmm. Ask yourself, I think most of those are white clovers. You might ask yourself, mm. why am I planting clover? And clover really doesn't like deep shade either. Right. So you probably want to go with some of the fescues, the chewing fescues uh, that aren't as tough as uh, a bluegrass, but they will tolerate low shade. And um, I don't really see the advantage in a, uh, a you know, micro clover. Okay, yeah. okay. okay. Um, Francis from Duluth, when's the best time to plant honeysuckle vine? Oh. oh, well, you could do it now. Definitely mm -hmm. do it now. They're going to be hardy enough. It mm -hmm. uh, just depends if you're getting it out of a greenhouse or if you're getting a bare rootstock. If one's coming out, you don't you want to acclimate it a bit, and then. But if it's rootstock, definitely right you know, now. If you're getting it yep. in. Um, and there, there's hardier varieties available with more colors too. I mean, besides the scarlet and same kind of thing. People really do want to look. For zone three, Absolutely. if you can, so they're good and hardy. And then, uh, if you've got zone three material, it's great, great time to plant mm -hmm. is right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Liz from Evelyn is wondering about a flowering shrub that I can grow in semi-wet, full sun area. Oh, semi-wet. Oh, semi um, hmm. But a shrub. Yeah. You know, we're gonna we're gonna have a lot of forsythia break pretty soon. Mm -hmm, and you know, mm -hmm. I'm thinking, what was uh, this? Does obvious, forsythia do well in that kind of condition? It's going to have to have reasonable yeah. drainage, drainage, but you see a lot of them along the North Shore where we have heavier mm -hmm. clays. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of forsythia growing there. There's one variety called sure. Northern Sun that's mm -hmm. very, yeah, very, okay. very, hard. very hardy. It, and it sends out the runners and sends it, it'll, runners. it'll get good size. But what about an Arctic blue willow? I, I was going to suggest okay. willow. Yeah. Willows, you know, they're not flowering as such, sure. but mm -hmm. they're very attractive right they now. They are right? lovely. It is. Yeah. It has nice flow. Mm -hmm. I mean, it looks like a And that's mm -hmm. some of the first color you're going to see in the landscape are from yeah. the willows. So mm -hmm. anything in the willow family w would do well under those okay. conditions. Okay. Uh, Diane from Hermantown wants to know, how do I plant my Easter lily? Oh. Oh. Well. Just plunk it in the ground? Plunk it in the ground. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. What are you, yeah. Is, that, is that? You can, and then okay. you'll get more bulbs, I mean, bulbets, and then you'll sure. have to take it out in the fall. That's but, right. And then plant it again. The okay. challenge is bringing them in and getting them to flower again. So mm -hmm. not yeah, getting the them to grow. Length is going to be. She's going to be able to get them to grow without any problem. Just Absolutely. Putting it in June mm -hmm. 1, and she'll be real happy there, but getting it to flower again is the next challenge. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, more questions coming up. Good answers, though, you guys. Um, Preschoolers to college kids are getting their hands dirty in outdoor classrooms called gardens, and they're learning a whole array of different lessons. Here at the Land Lab, we're really trying to serve an important, not just university function, but regional function, introducing lots and lots of young people to the benefits and the trade-offs of local agriculture and of course the wonderful tastes that you can produce from our soil and uh, the relationships that come out of that. We founded this program, the Sustainable Agriculture Project in 2009, cover crop the first fields in 2010, began production in 2011. I am a gardener, kind of a couple of generations removed from you know, the, the growing your own food. So learning all this is kind of, you know, re, you know, reskilling and learning how to not only grow food, but, you know, put it away when the, you know, canning and freezing and all that stuff that goes with it. So I think that farming's in my future. I have kids and food, you know, feeding your kids is a fundamental part of being a mom. And I want to be able to feed them the best way I can with, without hurting the environment at the same time. That's a beautiful one. So everyone gets to pick two kale leaves. I'm Britt Johnson. I'm a pro program coordinator here at the Duluth Community School Collaborative. Um, 
and we're here in the Myers Wilkins Guard Community Garden. This is one of our summer programs called Imagination Stations. The kids have helped um, start the seeds. They help transplant everything. They keep them weeded. They keep them watered. Um, and then the best part ha happens in August when we get to harvest things. <laughs> we are harvesting the vegetables, cooking with them, just so hopefully they enjoy them and see that locally grown tastes better <laughs> and you can or your own garden can taste really good. Susan, what's the good part to eat on the kale? And then we can make a compost pile for the scum. All right, now I'm going to add some oil and you can massage the oil in a little bit too. Oops. My favorite kind of vegetable is basil. I'm going to do this. I'm going to put them in the oven for about 10 minutes. All right, these ones might be a little hot coming out. What are your thoughts? Tastes like popcorn. Thumbs up. Crispy, salty. They're good. Tastes like popcorn, right? Tastes like. I like popcorn. Watch out, it's hot. What do you think, Penelope? Good. Great. Well, that's a couple different ways that people are, are learning about gardening. We'll head back to the UMD Land Lab a little bit later for more of a tour there, but I want to talk about those kids eating kale. Awesome. You know, it's just great to see because uh, that's a super healthy food for them. Well, it's always going to taste better. For kids, you know, they're, they're, they're not going to be the biggest fan of kale right away, but if you grow it yourself, they plant it, they harvest it. Right. You know, and there are many we varieties. We have some varieties here, right? Yep. So there's like uh, you know, Red Russian and a Storm Mix. There's all different varieties. And then other edibles like Bright Light Swiss chard is mm, fantastic. Yes. And then there's some um, smaller Caesars called Little Caesars and then just blends. And just find something that the kids are going to like. Mm -hmm. They'll plant it, they'll probably eat it, and it's going to taste a whole lot better and have better nutrition if you're not just getting it shipped in or, you know, at a right. store. Right. Yeah, actually, iceberg lettuce is, I think, it's the fifth most consumed vegetable in our diet. Mm -hmm. And I said, very little nutrition <laughs> compared to all these. And if you could mix in, like, kale in the cabbage family. Right. Mm -hmm. It's all about the dressing. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So that, too. Get some good dressing. But yeah. Kale ice cream. Kale ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Well, let's uh, get back to a few more questions. Um, Denny from the town of Big Sandy Lake has radishes that are getting eaten by maggots or something. Mm. What can he do? Okay. Wow. Yeah, very common, the root, root maggot, and um, he has a heavy infestation, and year after year, they're probably going to be there. Um, we really don't have any kind of a chemical pesticide, so there's some people that are just jumping out and jumping for joy. There's no easy way to control that right now for the homeowner. But I think covering with like a, uh, a remay type of product, a row cover mm -hmm. uh, that the light will penetrate and uh, they do overwinter in the soil. So you can't cover too early. So you want to let that, that radish uh, germinate and begin to grow and then get your coverings on there so the adult fly has the opportunity to escape. leave the soil, escape okay. and not, not re-enter. Not get back. Yeah, you can't just close them up and otherwise the, uh, the adults have just a field day inside your little mm. tunnel. That's probably the best and only control in that kind of situation. He sure. might stay away from radishes for a while. They will leave eventually and move to entirely different crops because once you get an infestation, they're there for you. Of. And it doesn't okay. matter if you move them? I mean, any type not of rotation a short doesn't help? No, not within a short distance. How, how far do you have to move? That's a good question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know. I'm at for another day. So. <laughs> okay. So Mike from Aurora. Sure. A long ways. <laughs> Mike from Aurora started some wave petunias in the basement with grow lights in the south window, natural light. Anyway, they've developed white spots on the tips of the leaves. Do Ooh. we know what's going on there? Sounds like salt burn. So, it sounds Sounds like salt burn, like um, the water might have uh, some kind of sodium in, or whatever their pH is that, and if the pH gets up, and then like if just the tips, it can be a salt burn, and then mm -hmm. he just needs to flush it out possibly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, if he's using um, uh, water from a municipal system, you can get fluoride burns. Mm -hmm. uh, anytime you're watering a house plant, particularly if you've got a real thin leaf and you don't want some of the burns, that these materials do work their way out to the edge where the margins where they're very thin mm -hmm. uh, just take it out let it sit for 24 hours so a lot of the these compounds volatilize oh. and then water with that uh, mm -hmm. that water at that point okay great Brenda um, from Duluth is having no luck with garlic bulbs planted last 
fall they have seemed to melt it in the soil. Is it possible to buy transplants and put them in now? Oh, you can you can plant garlic in the spring, but they never really bulb up. Mm -hmm. So you really oh, want to okay. you want to plant them in the fall. I'm kind of intrigued by why she's having this problem. They're yeah. turning to mush. Right. Is that what she oh. said? Uh, well, she said they've seemed to have melted in the soil. Melted. <laughs> Whatever. Some turning to mush. I mean, yeah. Yes, right. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. too heavy of a soil. I mean, uh, that's probably a fungal disease, probably oh, okay. a fusarium. Mm -hmm. So I think oh, uh, those okay. are diseased, and that's oh, what's occurring okay. there. Once again, she has to make sure that everything's clean. I wouldn't be planting any garlic in that area for a while, so find a new spot. And if she wants to, anyone can start this spring if you'd like, but mm -hmm. don't get your expectations right. too high. August 15th is when you really want to, or October 15th, you want sure. to get them planted, and you can harvest about October. You okay. Could plant in October, harvest in August. I'll get this right Right, right. <laughs> and then it's about April when they start scaping, is that, or is it uh, later? They'll scape a little bit earlier, and it's just oh, the hardneck okay. variety. Will they? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, not April. Later. Later, excuse okay. me. The, oh. um, <laughs> the hardneck varieties will, will scape, and you do want to. I did a little work on this. Um, it really does impact your, your yields if you don't mm -hmm. get those scapes cut oh. off. So you want to cut them as soon as they emerge and you've got to plan on doing it three or four times mm -hmm. because they, they emerge at different mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. Yep, Absolutely. Yeah, they are kind of a gourmet. Delicious. Okay, um, I think it's Linnea from Lake Nebagaman. Didn't cut back the hydrangea last year. Is it okay to cut them back now? Ooh. Depends on the variety. That's it, exactly. Uh, okay. And I would just say, I don't know, this is me again. I just wait for them to bloom and I shape them because there's not going to be a bud set. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you take a look at the hydrangea right now, mm -hmm. and you can see if it's oh, dead, if, if it's mm -hmm. dead, it's dead. Right. And that can be, and some can be pruned right to the ground. Like right. Yep. In mm -hmm. the summer. In the summer, we'll come. Take it yeah. right to the ground because it's going to bloom on, on new wood. Mm -hmm. Others will be set their buds in the fall, and you're going to have to take a close look at the plant. And mm -hmm. if it's if it's pliable, don't cut it. If it's uh, old and crispy yeah. and dead. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Okay, I think this is a yes or no answer. Bill from uh, Duluth Tomato Seed Packet says 70 days. Does that mean 70 days to harvest? From transplant. Well, is from he going to direct seed it? it? You know, or is he going to, which he shouldn't. No, 70 you're not, days not he won't get here. anything, but no. if he germinates it from transplant, it is almost 70 days to. Yeah, usually on, on like a tomato, it would be from transplant mm -hmm. rather than from seed because right. you want about another six to eight weeks from seed till you get your transplant. Yeah. And those are typically Iowa days. Okay. So um, use those. And we're not in Iowa. No, oh, I've noticed. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> I think okay. it's a little bit warmer right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Use it in a relative sense of 70 days. We obviously Very got good. more more growing season than that, mm -hmm. but that's going to be earlier maturing than say an 85 day. Yeah, that's not bad at all. Summer. 70 days isn't bad. Okay. All right. Well, now we're going to head back to the University of Minnesota Duluth Land Lab, where they grow abundant food crops while nurturing young minds. There's enormous economic, social, and ecological benefits to growing our own food. Young people are eager to um, figure out platforms where they can step into this and really contribute to a more sustainable world, a teaching farm, uh, community food systems incubator and a research farm and those are sort of the containers that speak to the different activities we do out here. The project was to collaborate with our dining services to once again be able to serve whole foods on campus for the first time in several decades and so over this eight nine ten years we have worked with our executive chef Tom Linderholm and others to identify about 10 different crops that really work for them. Well, we have 30 acres as a kind of site, but we have about 10 acres of production. It's a site of both perennial and annuals, and uh, it works well for uh, both. This year, it's a winter squash field, and the Hubbards are looking fine here. This is a difficult soil in this region, particularly here, but they're doing very well. So this year, it just seems like it's working well for our squash types. Uh, tomatoes and peppers, they're doing great. And so I started going out with our, looking at some of the larger varieties that were meant for our area and came across a variety called Pontiac and a red called Red Hawk. And last year, they just knocked it out of the park. We each, each onion was over you know, a pound a piece. They cured up nicely. The, the chefs on campus loved them. This is our brassica field. We've harvested a lot of cabbage already for the dining services. We produce 
an enormous amount of broccoli. Hunter Smith here is pulling the runners off the strawberries so that they put energy into the fruit production. We have about four varieties here. They're on white plastic, which provides beneficial services in the growth, but also keeps them clean, Keep, you know, with the straw and, and, and you know how berries can attract dirt when it rains or whatever. Now we're getting the field heat off the cukes by getting them into sinks of cold water. We'll give them a quick rinse and then we're counting out and trimming off ends, basically getting, getting them prepped for delivery. So we'll have these probably on the road here within an hour. I am a biology and environment and sustainability major. I definitely, you know, would like to have my own farm actually and, uh, you know, be able to use what I learned here and in class. Most of these students, they have lots of passion, but very little practical understanding. They know sustainability from their classes, but they don't have a platform to apply that in. And it's, it's a wonderful gift that we can provide them that platform. It's interesting to see how many young people are really interested in growing their own food and doing gardening and farming and uh, seems to be a trend. Mm -hmm. A trend that we really need as a country because mm -hmm. uh, weight issues and other things continue to go the wrong direction. Yeah. So mm -hmm. this is all great. Any way you can influence anyone in your life at any age from a real young to mm -hmm. uh, college age and on up, uh, it's all good. Absolutely. Okay, let's take a look at this apple tree. Uh, this is sent in from Steve Smith. He, he was told it was fire blight about three years ago, pruned it back, but um, it blooms, doesn't make any apples. Here's a, here's a closer look at it, a couple side-by-side -side pictures. Is, is that going to survive? That looks pretty tough for a lot of yes. reasons. Now, I'm seeing it could well be sun scald. I'm seeing darkened areas. That doesn't necessarily confirm it's fire blight. There are three or four things. I'm not seeing come some of the classic shepherd's crook that you'll see and so forth. So not so sure. But on sun scald, may, that should have been covered by snow this year at least. Right. But the tree w wasn't going to be long for this world anyway because of the way it was initially pruned very soon one of those lateral crotches is going to split right down the center anyway. So I'm going to Not just going to suggest uh, we can't tell for sure what caused that, okay. but I think it's time for a replacement. We don't, we don't have a lot of time left, but this is another apple question from Terry. <laughs> uh, Harold, Harold Red, Harold, 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 Red, Red, Red. Harold Red, and stage for apple trees that have scab. What do you recommend? Scab fungal disease, and if you want to stay away from all fungicides and all spraying, and people laugh at this, but I, I still go to a bag system. Get yourself just a, a little baggie, a sandwich bag, and when that fruit's beginning to form, bag them up. And people okay. say that's a lot of work. And mm -hmm. I said, well, you've never sprayed. you got to spray every and, week, plus and, all the residues. Mm -hmm. uh, and he mentions bonide, fruit tree spray, lime, sulfur. There are a lot of products okay. that can be sprayed, but it, once again, it's only going to last for about five to seven days, mm -hmm. and some are less toxic than others and it's a lot of work, you miss one or two sprays, you're still gonna have the problem with scab as well as the insect issues. Mm -hmm. okay. You get insects and disease controlled by just bagging. Mm -hmm. All right, yep. thanks. We wanna take a look now at some of the garden photos sent in by viewers from throughout the Northland. Springtime can't come soon enough to the gardens of Ethy K in Virginia, especially when the results are so bright and beautiful. Last year, beds of tulips included stunners like these, offset by sunshine yellow daffodils. There's also a selection of ruffled tulips outstanding with their frilled petals. The yellow lady slipper multiplied from a plant purchased years ago at a Wisconsin greenhouse. Ethy also grows gorgeous pink columbine, offset by dainty blue forget-me-nots. Ed and Mary Kay of Duluth love to create an oasis-like setting on their deck, where morning coffee is enjoyed beneath and among the pots of bright petunias and vining foliage. Another favorite is the black-eyed Susan vine. And who wouldn't want to perch by the birdhouse at almost any time of day? If you have pictures of beautiful blooms or favorite garden settings, send them to greatgardening at wdse.org so we can show what you grow. 
Love those pictures coming in. Okay, one calendar item. We don't usually do book signings, but this is by yours truly. It's a book called Emma V that I wrote and my daughter illustrated, and we're going to have a launch and a signing at Zenith Bookstore in West Duluth. That's coming up on Monday night. There's stuff on our website, a link to that, but here it is. You guys uh, got, got to look folks at it. This? Yeah, we can. You know, there's stuff on the website. We uh, have that there. But uh, yeah, Bob, go ahead, show off the book. Why not? It's adorable. <laughs> it's adorable. Yeah. You know what I love about it? Yeah. A great mother daughter project. It's exceptionally well done and it mm -hmm. fits right with a theme of pollinators That's and pollinator right. guns. It, it mm -hmm. so means perfect. to teach a story about the importance of pollination to young children. So, anyway, it's and a fun adorable. thing. And it's something about my level I think I can actually do. <laughs> okay. Not the book. All right. <laughs> All right, we'll have adorable. to get you a copy. Wonderful. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wonderful. <laughs> Okay, thanks you guys. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of Great Gardening. We want to thank you so much, Bob and Deb. Great, um, great discussion tonight. Lots of good information. Thanks to our phone volunteers from the Duluth Garden Flower Society, the Morgan Park Club. And as always, a big thank you to all who called in questions and to everyone watching from all of us here. Enjoy the garden. Mm -hmm.